Welcome to Lecture Online, and here we're going to see something amazing regarding the discovery and the understanding of the Big Bang. We've already seen a bunch of videos where we started puzzling things together, where we started seeing the cosmic background radiation, and what it meant, and what the size of it meant, and how the universe has grown in size and cooled down to almost absolute zero, just a few degrees above absolute zero, and where we knew, or at least figured out that the universe must have been extremely hot at the very beginning, filled with this radiation at that time at very, very short wavelengths at very, very high temperatures. Now let's put all this together and make you understand how this is such a tremendous discovery. So here we're going to talk about E equals mc squared, probably the most known and famous equation in, in, on the Earth in physics, and how it relates to the temperature of the early universe. So what Einstein discovered was that matter that has mass and energy were basically the same thing in different forms. He said that mass can change into energy and energy can change into mass and the equation that related to was E equals mc squared. E stands for energy, m stands for mass. So what he was claiming was that you could have a photon, now a photon is a chunk of energy, and a photon at very high energies could spontaneously turn into matter, objects that have mass, volume, and consistency and so a photon can instantaneously change from a photon that is pure energy and has no mass into two objects that actually have mass, a particle and an antiparticle. We discovered that whenever mass is created from energy, that it usually does that in pairs, a particle and an antiparticle. And when a particle and an antiparticle meet, they annihilate each other and turn right back into pure energy. So since we know how much mass particles have, we can figure out how much energy is required to make those particles. For example, we know that a, the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So we can actually calculate, using the equation E equals mc squared, how much energy it takes to make one proton, and how much energy it takes to make one electron. We can express that in terms of joules, or in terms of electron volts, like 938 million electron volts, or 511,000 uh, electron volts to make an electron. So since we know how much energy it takes, and we also discovered that a single photon has energy according to this equation, it's equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the radiation. So however fast the energy oscillates up and down, that's the frequency, multiplied times a constant h, h is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. If we multiply those two things together, we can calculate the energy of a photon. We can also express the energy in terms of its wavelength because we know that the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So the frequency can be expressed as the speed of light divided by the wavelength. If we plug that in here instead of f, we then have hc over lambda. And if we then take this equation and solve for the wavelength, for the energy needed to make that matter, we can see what the wavelength of the energy had to be in order to make it in order for it to make matter. So the whole idea was this radiation that currently exists in the universe, that is now grown to a size of one millimeter, must be very, very short in wavelength, very high energy, and capable of making matter. The idea was that matter was made from energy at the very early stage of the universe, and for it to do that, it had to have energy at very short wavelengths to make matter. How short a wavelength? We can actually figure that out because the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by energy required to make the matter. But since, of course, we make a proton and an antiproton, electron and antielectron, a neutron and antineutron, and so forth, as long as those particles have to be made in pairs, we have to account for twice the mass of each particle, or twice the, what we call the energy for each particle. All right, so the wavelength that you would need, the wavelength that a photon would have to be in order to have enough energy to make two protons would have to be this number right here, and the wavelength would be this number right here, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 16 meters. If we then take that wavelength and put it into Wien's law, that equates to a temperature of 4.4 times 10 to the 12 Kelvin. That is trillions of Kelvin. So the universe had to be at least 4.4 trillion Kelvin degrees hot for the energy or the radiation that we currently are seeing, the cosmic background radiation, for that radiation to be capable of making protons and antiprotons. Then as the universe cooled, presumably, as the universe expanded, the wavelengths get longer, wavelengths get longer, the energy, see, if the wavelength gets bigger, the energy of the photon gets smaller, and therefore it could no longer make protons and antiprotons, but it could still make electrons and antielectrons. 
And so the energy required to make electrons is much lower. Therefore, it doesn't need as much energy in the radiation to do that. So the wavelength to make two electrons can be calculated the same way, but it's only 1.22 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, much longer wavelengths with less energy. That equates, using Wien's law, to a temperature of 2.4 times 10 to 9 Kelvin, which means 2.4 billion Kelvin. So the universe was ferociously making protons and antiprotons until the temperature dropped below 4.4 trillion degrees Kelvin. As the universe continued to cool down, it was still able to make electrons until the temperature of the, of the universe, as it expanded and the wavelength got longer, dropped below 2.4 billion Kelvin. So here we're beginning to form a picture of what the early universe must have looked like. We know the universe is expanding. We know that it's still filled with the radiation left over from the very beginning universe when matter was no longer being made. Whatever leftover energy was there is still there today, but tremendously stretched. But we know how hot the universe must have been back in the early stage of the universe for matter to have been created from the energy. Again, those are theories, but are they correct? Physics shows that that is the way it should have happened if everything the way we see it today unfolded the way we think it did and then pointing back to those observations that we're seeing today. The cosmic background radiation discovery and how the universe expanded since the beginning and how we know the universe is expanding today at what rate, if we then go back and play the picture backwards, we can begin to form a picture of what it must have been at the very beginning of the universe. A tremendously hot, small, dense universe, so hot in the trillions of degrees that the energy that we currently see the remnants of was able to produce matter at ferocious rates. When the universe cooled, the matter then could no longer be made as far as protons and neutrons, but still electrons. The universe cooled additionally than that. Then all of a sudden, matter formation stopped. The universe was filled with matter and filled with the leftover radiation. And from that moment to what it is today, this is how the universe evolved from that time to today's universe. A tremendous story. And this is what we think the Big Bang was. And if you're still interested, stay tuned for the next videos because we're continuing to unravel this big mystery of what the Big Bang must have been and what it means to us today.